Thank you, Thomas. So thank you, everybody, for having me here. Can you hear me? Yes? All right, excellent. So I'm Daniel. I'm from IBM Research. I'm based in Zurich. And today, I'll be telling you a little bit about some work that we did here on circuit cutting. And this will basically be working with some of our ego processors and connecting them together. Now, the uh, observation is the following. Superconducting qubit chips typically have a limited connectivity. And you can see this here in this particular image where you have one of our ego processors. Each dot is a qubit, and each line is a connection between the qubits. And you can see here that this is planar and relatively sparse. And this is often a bit of an issue for applications that want to run on the hardware. So the talk will be about circuit cutting and how we can engineer a little bit more connectivity in these devices. The outline of the presentation is going to be the following. I will introduce circuit cutting with local operations and circuit cutting with local operations and classical communication. After that, I'll talk about how we engineered periodic boundary conditions on a graph state on 103 qubits. And then I'll talk about how we connected two quantum processors to engineer a graph state spanning both devices. So without further ado, let's talk a bit about circuit knitting. Now, if you're wondering what circuit knitting is, you'll see in the end it is basically just this. So let's, let's dive into it. Let's say that I have a quantum channel here, E, that I would like to implement. And this quantum channel, what you can show is that you can express it as a sum over different quantum channels, E sub I here, with a prefactor AI. Now, there might be a lot of quantum channels here to uh, perform the sum over, but crucially, these channels will be a little bit easier to implement on the hardware. And I'll make this a bit more concrete, what I mean by easy in the following slides. Now, crucially, if you take a look at this sum here, you will see that it does not form a valid probability distribution, simply because these coefficients, AI, they don't necessarily sum to one. and They might also be negative. And so this is a bit of a problem if you want to sample different realizations from this. Now, the way out of this is what we call a quasi-probability decomposition. What we do is we take this equation here and we transform it to the one that you can see here. So what we've done is we've introduced this factor gamma here, which is simply the sum over the absolute value of these coefficients. And then we normalize these AIs by gamma and take the absolute value and factor out the sign. And now if I look at this equation, what you see here is that we have a valid probability distribution with absolute value of AI divided by gamma being a probability. And this is now interpreted as quantum channel D sub i, the whole thing. So this is basically the mathematical framework of, of circuit cutting. It's nothing more than sum over quantum channel. So let's take a look at an example of how this might actually be implemented on hardware. And here we're taking the decomposition of a controlled Z gate. This was shown by Mita Rai et al. in this paper here in 2023. Basically, what they do is the following. They take a controlled Z gate here, and they implement it as a sum over six different quantum circuits here. This means that if I want to cut this gate, instead of running a single circuit, I will need to run six different quantum circuits, and I will reconstruct the expectation values that I'm interested in. I will need to weight them according to these prefactors here. And what is nice is that you can see that the top part of the circuit here separates from the bottom one. In all of these six instances, there is not a quantum gate that connects the two. It's either Z rotations on the single qubits or measurements, namely mid-circuit measurements, right? So this basically shows you how you can cut a gate with a local operation. Now, the other protocol that we looked at in this work is local operations and classical communication. So how does this work? Well, you can show that there's an equivalence between a C0 gate here and a bell pair. Essentially, what you can do is you can take a bell pair and you can consume it in this teleportation circuit here. 
So if I want to create a C0 gate between the top qubit and the bottom qubit, shown here, I take this bell pair, I do some C0 gates here between these qubits, and then I have to measure in the Z basis here and in the X basis here. And conditional on these measurements, I then apply speed forward gate into my quantum circuit. And you can show that this whole thing is equivalent to a C0 gate. Now, if you're wondering what this bell pair is, it's fairly simple. It just looks a little bit like the following. If you have two qubits in the ground state, you can have a Hadamard and a C0, and this is going to create your entanglement resource that you can consume in this teleportation circuit. So now, if the intent is to implement a C0 gate, you might tell me, well, hey, you haven't really done much here, right? It seems like a C0 gate with extra steps. We have a few more C0 gates here, and then we have this teleportation circuit, which is rather costly to implement experimentally. Moreover, what we are interested in doing is implementing this thing here as a long range C0 gate, right? For instance, the C0 gate could be between qubit zero and qubit 99 in a very long chain of superconducting qubits. So up until this point, we haven't really advanced much in terms of creating long ranged gates or extra connectivity. Now, where this actually comes into play is that we can start cutting these bell pairs. Namely, we implement them once again with a quasi-probability decomposition. And this is exactly what you see here. For a single bell pair, I can create uh, it with a QPD, as shown here. And I'll have different parameter sets over which I need to execute. And if I will do this here, you will see that we are able, in fact, to consume this virtual resource and create a long-range C0 gate. And nicely, you can see that there is no connection, quantum connection, between the top part of the quantum circuit here and the bottom part. The only connection that we have is this classical link between the two. So one thing to point out with this LOCC scheme is that the cost of performing the cut reduces with the number of bell pairs that you cut simultaneously. So if we go back a couple of slides to the equation of the QPD that I showed, we factored out in front of this decomposition, this pre-factor gamma. And when you calculate the expectation values of observables, you would see that this gamma factor increases the variance, right? And so basically, if you want to compensate for this increase in variance stemming from the QPD, you need to take extra shots on your hardware. So there's a price to pay to do this circuit cutting. And the price is very heavy. This gamma factor for the decomposition of the CZ gate that I showed before was three. Namely, that if I wanted to keep my statistics in hand, I would need to run about a factor of nine times more shots on the hardware, right? So gamma squared. So gamma is really a heavy price to pay. Then what is nice with this LOCC scheme is that you can show that as you cut more and more bell pairs together, the cost of this cutting decreases. So if I cut a single bell pair, the cost is a gamma factor of three. If I cut two bell pairs together, the cost per bell pair goes down from three to 2.65. And if you cut three together, this goes down to 2.47. So one of the contributions of this work was actually to work out these circuits here that create these cut bell pair factories. I won't go into the details of how we did this, but it is described in the archive paper that I showed. Now, once again, you can see here that when you do this cutting of these bell pairs, you have, for instance, in the case of two bell pairs, this circuit that you need to implement. And once again, there is no connection between the top part here and the bottom part of the circuit. So this allows you to split the circuit into local operations, and then the classical communication in this teleportation circuit. And so these are the two schemes that we will be using to implement long-ranged gates on our hardware in this experiment. Now, the LOCC scheme comes with a little bit of added complexity because you need dynamic circuits. And so a dynamic circuit is the following. You take a measurement, and then during the lifetime of the qubit, so before it decays, you need to act either on that same qubit or other qubits. And this is what is shown here, right? Now, 
there are four different cases in this teleportation circuit that we need to deal with. Either these two measurements produce 0, 0, or they produce 0, 1, or 1, 0, or 1, 1. And so the control electronics needs to be able to handle this. And the way that we do this is with what we call a switch instruction. So these measurements, they get stored into a classical register. And then based on that, you have a, let's say, jump in the memory of the program that happens. And this jump either executes one of these four code blocks. So either I do not do anything, or I do an X gate on the bottom qubit. This is in case 0, 1. In the case 1, 0, I would do a Z gate on the top qubit. And in case both measurements came back with a 1, I need to do a Z and X gate on the two qubits, as shown here. Now, I want to put these operations a little bit in perspective. And maybe I go back one slide here. The coherence times of the qubits that we have are on the order of maybe two to 300 microseconds. A two qubit gate takes on the order of a few hundred of nanoseconds. And these measurements, they take about a microsecond. So compared to the coherence time, it's already starting to be significant. Furthermore, you need to add about another microsecond for the control hardware to decide what it's going to do. So all in all, you're paying a little bit of extra latency in these dynamic circuits. And during these latencies, some very bad things can happen to the qubits. They can decohere. But you can also have crosstalk, like spurious ZZ interactions in the chip that start messing up the expectation values and the computations that you're doing. And so this is where error mitigation comes in. So we employed two different techniques uh, that keep these errors under control. The first one is error suppression. And by error suppression, we simply mean dynamical decoupling. And as error mitigation technique, we used zero noise extrapolation. So the idea behind zero noise extrapolation, you make things worse on purpose, and you run the computation multiple times, and then you extrapolate back to the zero order noise limit. So let me guide you through this a little bit. On the cross resonance hardware that we have, we have very strong static ZZ interactions. And this tends to be something that we do not want to have. Now you can get rid of this ZZ interaction if you have dynamical decoupling as shown here. So you can see here, dynamical decoupling sequences applied to the qubits during the idle time. And importantly here, we stagger these dynamical decoupling sequences so that we can explicitly cancel out these unwanted ZZ interactions. Now, one thing that is not properly reflected on this slide is that while the control electronics is deciding what it should do next, we simply cannot apply any gate, at least at the time when we did this experiment, meaning that you had to wait and you couldn't do anything. You couldn't even apply dynamical decoupling. And so the way out of this was to make this whole delay longer by a factor of four on purpose. So instead of waiting about 0 0.75 microseconds, we instead had to wait around three microseconds specifically to be able to add these staggered sequences as shown here. So these delays here, this one, this one, and this one are extra. And then furthermore, to be able to control this delay, we add a little bit more delay here shown in dark blue. And this is the delay that we will be stretching in order to make the errors worse. And this is what is shown on this axis here. So one is more or less the shortest that I can do with these staggered dynamical decoupling sequences. And then when I start to stretch the circuit here, you can see that the values get worse. So what we were measuring here was some observable whose ideal value should be one. So we make the computation worse, and then we can extrapolate back to the zero order noise limit. And this is then in effect error mitigation of dynamic circuit. So with that, I want to go to the first use case that we showed, namely periodic boundary conditions. And the task that we set out for ourselves is to demonstrate the circuit cutting with graph states. Now, a graph state is nothing too complicated. What you do is you take a graph, as shown here, and each node 
in this graph corresponds to a qubit, and each edge corresponds to a gate that I need to apply between the qubits. And so I can simply map this into a quantum circuit as shown here. So we start off with Hadamard's, and then we need to apply these gates here, following the topology of this graph. Now, graph states, they have these properties that they are observables called stabilizers. And these stabilizers have an expectation value of one on these graph states. So it's something that we can easily measure. And if the observable is not a stabilizer, then the expectation value is zero. And this is kind of nice because if we implement the right graph, then we can check the stabilizers to see if they're one. And if they are, then that's nice. If there were errors, then these typically drop down to zero. Right? So it's a simple test to see whether or not you have implemented the graph state. And these single qubit gates that you can see here, these are the basis changes of the measurement in order to measure the different stabilizers that we will need to do. So how does circuit cutting look like in this particular setting? Let's take a graph state. It should uh, come up pretty soon here. Sorry, this is a little bit slow. So if I want to perform circuit cutting with local operations only on this graph state, what we do is we would cut the gate between qubits 1 and 2, for instance. And this would result in these six circuits that we need to run. So we now have some parameterized gates here with angles theta. And sometimes these are replaced by mid-circuit measurements. And when recombining all of the statistics from the final measurements, we need to take into account this mid-circuit measurement here. So this is what implementation with LO looks like on the hardware. With LOCC, it's a tiny bit more complicated. What we do is we cut the gate, and then we insert this cut bell pair between the two that we then consume in the teleportation circuit, as shown here. So we can see that these are the two qubits that should share this bell pair. And then you have the teleportation. Now, the goal that we first set out was to engineer a graph state on 103 qubits on one Eagle device. So you can see here the coupling map. And this is what it would look like in 3D, where these blue edges are the ones that we want to cut. And this then requires long-ranged gates between, let's say, these qubits and these ones. Now, you can see also here that I left out a few qubits from the device, and this is simply because those qubits were fairly noisy, plagued, for instance, by two-level systems or other types of um, unwanted uh, business on the qubits, let's say. So what is the metric of success for the implementation of these different circuit cutting schemes on the hardware? What we did is we created an edge with it. And so these witnesses here, they are observables that allow you to detect a certain type of entanglement, or at least the statistics of said entanglement. And the witness that we construct here is the sum of these three stabilizer values. You can show that if there is entanglement across, for instance, an edge here, or if you have the statistics of entanglement, then this witness should be <laughs> below zero. right? So we're going to set out to measure this observable and see whether or not it is below zero. And so for this particular edge, these are the three stabilizers that you would need to measure. And then what we do is we do a statistical test on this witness. So we want to see how much it deviates from its ideal value of minus 1 half. So this is the ideal value. This is the expectation value of our witness. And crucially, and what is very nice with these statistical tests is that you also have to take into account the variance of your observable. And if this, if, sorry, if this variance is too large, then your statistical test fails. And this is very nice for circuit cutting because circuit cutting tends to blow up the variance. And so if you can pass this test, this then shows that you also have your variance under control. So we compared three, sorry, four different implementations to create this graph state with periodic boundary condition. The first one is using swap gates. If I want to implement the gate between the top qubit here and the bottom qubit, then I swap the state of these qubits all through the lattice. And this is going to be very costly, because keep in mind that on the hardware, 
a single CNOT gate has an error rate of about close to 1%, sometimes a little bit better. But basically, each swap gate is going to give you an error of around maybe 3%. So if I want to swap these two qubits, I get an error of 3%. If I swap it further, 6 and so on and so forth. Right? And so you can see here that implementing long-range gates is extremely costly with swap operations. Next, we have the LOCC scheme shown here. So this also comes at a cost, but not as costly as the swap gates. First, we need to cut uh, four gates. This requires four cut bell pairs. And the way that we run this, this requires 27 times more circuits to execute, plus whatever error mitigation you are doing for the dynamic circuits. The gamma of this QPD is 2.65. Since we have two bell pairs executed in parallel, you have to square this. So basically, we are looking at taking this number here for the power of four more shots to control the variance. And of course, if you have these cut bell pairs, you need to have four additional qubits, which are highlighted here in blue, right? So this is the cost of running this thing with LOC. Then we have the LO scheme. This does not require any additional qubits, but we do have to run more circuits, 36 here, compared to 27 for the LOCC. The gamma is also a little bit higher for this decomposition. So it's got a gamma of 3 instead of 2.65. But crucially, we do not need these additional qubits here. And then finally, we want to benchmark this. And we are going to do this benchmarker with respect to a graph state that simply does not implement these long-ranged gates at all. And we are going to refer to this as the dropped edge benchmark. So with that, I'll start getting into the results here that we have. So this is data taken on IBM Kiev. And on the x-axis here, you have the node stabilizers of the graph. The first eight stabilizers here correspond to the nodes that are immediately on the cuts. So that would be here, 1, 2, 6, 7, 95, 98, 102, and 97, right? So these are these stabilizers. The next one here are the stabilizers that are one node away from a cut. So what do we see? We see here that in this dropped edge benchmark, when I'm away from the edges that I have dropped, I measure values of 1 for these stabilizers as should be the case. However, when I'm on this cut edge, you can see that this value drops to zero. And this is what we would like to recover with the circuit cutting. We would like these to go back up to one. If we look at the entanglement witnesses for the edges, so you can see here that uh, these witnesses are the witnesses of the edges that are cut. They simply do not detect entanglement. They are positive, right? This makes sense. And for the edges that are one edge away, from the cut edges, these witnesses are statistically identical to zero. So you cannot say that you have witnessed the statistics of entanglement here. When you go to the bulk of the graph, you can see now that you recover a value of minus 0 0.5 on this dropped edge. So the first experiment that we did here is with the swaps. So we do a lot of swapping to bring these long range gates together. And you can see that if you do that, you pay a heavy price you recover a little bit of the stabilizers over the cut there. They are slightly better. But the values in the bulk, they are way worse, simply because we had to do a lot of swapping. This is why the red declined to the blue. This really shows that implementing long-ranged gates with swap operations is extremely costly when you have limited connectivity on the device. And then here we have the results from the LOC. You can see that we nicely preserve the value of the stabilizers in the bulk. And then the ones that are affected by the cut, they come pretty close to one here. So the error mitigation is shown here by this sort of little white extra, which is compensating for some of the errors of the dynamic circuits, right? And so here we see some of the complexity that we are paying simply because the circuits are a little bit harder to execute on the hardware. But crucially, if you look at the witness values here, they come fairly close to minus 0 0.5. And you can also show that they pass this statistical test. If you start looking at these error bars, you would simply believe that this is statistically negative, right? 
And then the same is true for the circuit cutting with LO. These are the orange bars that you can see here. They nicely preserve the stabilizers in the bulk, and it performs a little bit better with the stabilizers here on the cuts. And this is simply because the circuits are a bit easier to implement. You don't have this costly dynamic operation that you need to implement with all its delays. So and just to recap a little bit these results here, if you do the full graph with swaps, you will only be able to see about 80% of the, uh, sorry, 80 of the edges, which are successful, corresponds to a success rate of about 70%. For LOCC and LO, we're able to recover the statistics of entanglement on all of the edges on this graph state. So this is very nice. And then in the drop edge benchmark, the best that you can do is around 88, 89% success rate. And so here I have a little bit more data showing a little bit the quality of these here. In red for the nodes, you have the error on the stabilizers. And then the edges, they are black. If we witness the statistics of entanglement and think if we do not. And you can see that with the swaps, we have a lot of errors. With the circuit cutting being LOCC or LO, this looks very nice, very small errors, all the edges pass. And then here with the drop edge, you can see that the node stabilizers close to the cuts have high errors, as you would imagine. And then the ones, and so the witnesses close to these cuts also fail to show the statistics of entanglement. And this makes sense because in this benchmark, we did not implement these long range gates. Now, we also did a little bit of an analysis of the variance. And what you are seeing here is a distribution of the variance of these stabilizers that we measure. And so you can compare, let's say, the variance of LO to LOCC. And what you expect from theory is that the variance of LO should be about 9 squared. And for LOCC, the amplification of the variance is 7 squared. So if you compare the ratio of these two quantities, you should see about an increase in variance or a factor of about 1.65 with LO compared to LOCC. And for this particular experiment here, we witness an increase of about 1.49. Now, this is not too bad, but I also have the caution that in the um, next experiments, we will see the opposite. The variance of the LO is a little bit better than the variance of the LOCC. So with that, let's go and take a look at creating a graph state that spans two ego processors. So what we have is we have two QPUs with 127 qubits each in the same dilution refrigerator, but there is no quantum link between the two. The only connection that we have between the two QPUs is this classical communication. And this is what will allow us to implement the LOCC scheme that I showed. And this means that we need to have a very tight synchronization between the control electronics of both processors. Because when I measure something on, let's say, QPU2, I need to perform an operation on QPU1 within the coherence time of the qubit. So the graph state that we wanted to engineer in this particular case is this ring here. It's basically made up of these hex rings that snake through the device. So here and here. And then we will be performing circuit cutting on the gates, which are at the edge here, between here and here, and between here and here. Now note that there's also some qubits that we excluded here from this on the edges. And this is simply because we had, for instance, on one of the chips, a dead readout. right? So we needed to exclude some of them. And once again, the gates that we are cutting are the ones that we can see here in blue. I won't go into as much detail of these results compared to the previous one, but what I will show here is the cumulative distribution function of the errors of these stabilizers. So here I have the absolute stabilizer error on the x-axis, and on the y-axis we have the CDS. Basically, the closer that these curves are to the left, the less errors we have, which is very nice. Now you can see that for the drop edge benchmark, all of the stabilizers that have a large error are the ones on the edges that we did not implement, the ones that we dropped. You can see now that with 
LO and LOCC, we are able to get much better values for these edges here. These are the stars, right? So it shows that we can nicely implement these edges that we cut. And the rest of the distribution of the values, they follow this hardware native benchmark shown here in red. Then here, once again, for the witness error, we'll see here sort of a similar trend in the distribution. It follows the bulk, and then we get these cut edges here to have much lower errors with LO and LOCC, showing a nice increase in the quality of the results. If once again, you do the statistical test, on the edges that you cut, you will see that with this dropped edge, you don't implement about 8% of the edges. This makes sense. The implementation with swap gates is simply impossible because we don't have a quantum connection between the two QPUs. And you can do LOCC and LO, and if you do that, you recover the statistics of entanglement on all of the edges that we cut. So this is a very nice demonstration of the scheme. Now, as discussed before, we want to take a look at the expected increase in the variance of the stabilizers that we measure. And you can see here that we would be expecting an increase of 1.65, but what we measure is 0 0.91. So there's a few reasons why this might be. The first one is simply experimental noise. These runs, they take at least a good half hour to gather the data, all of the data that you need. And they were also done on different days. Right, So device properties might have changed a little bit from one day to the next, which could, in, which could result in this discrepancy. Furthermore, the bounds on the gammas, they might not actually be tight. Right? So there might be some theoretical leeway here. Now, what I want to do is I want to do a quick, uh, quick shout out to some work that we did also with uh, Christian here on improving dynamical decoupling sequences. And this was a paper that we put on the archive a few days ago. And it shows kind of an optimal control inspired fashion of doing some dynamical decoupling or improving the sequences, where we keep the sequence of gates fixed and we optimize the angles of the rotations in these gates. And what we were able to show is that this tends to outperform, let's say, canonical dynamical decoupling. And you can see that if you don't do dynamical decoupling during, let's say, these mid-circuit measurements, you have a big decrease in fidelity. But if you do the dynamical decoupling, you get better fidelity. And if you optimize the dynamical decoupling, you can further enhance this fidelity. So these are, let's say, sort of approaches that we could use to further suppress errors in these dynamic circuits that I was showing in the previous part of the presentation. So I quickly want to summarize then what we did in this uh, paper. We showed how to create, let's say, circuit cutting between two chips on different processes that are not connected. We did this with LO and LOCC. And we were able to engineer graph states with periodic boundary conditions on a single chip, but also connecting two chips. Now, one thing that is also quite important with this work is that we showed how to error mitigate what is going on in these dynamic circuits. And what this means is that if you can start bringing in elements of quantum transduction where you would share bell pairs from a coherent source across two different chips, you could actually get rid of the quasi-probability decomposition, meaning that you would no longer need to do all of the circuit statistics that I was doing in this work. So a quick, quick outlook and summary here. LO requires more circuits than LOCC, but these circuits are somewhat simpler to implement because we do not have the dynamic component. Next steps would be to start looking at circuit cutting in an application context. Keep in mind that the cost of using circuit cutting is exponential in the number of gates that you cut. So you have to use it sparingly in unselected gates. The cost of this cutting also depends on the amount of entanglement in the gate. So if you are looking at, for instance, a trotterized evolution where the rotation angles are small and the amount of entanglement per gate is small, then the cost of the cutting becomes more bearable. We need 
improved error mitigation for the mid-circuit measurement and the feed-forward instructions, if we didn't need, or rather, if we could do gates during the decision latency of the control electronics, we would already have much less errors in the circuitry shown here. We'd also need improvements on error suppression. So for instance, gapless dynamical decoupling. This refers to the fact that you can do dynamical decoupling while the control electronics is deciding what it wants to do, but also improved dynamical decoupling sequences tailored to the noise as what Christian did, for instance. And so with that, I'm more or less at the end of the presentation. I think this leaves time for uh, quite a few questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Daniel, for this uh, talk. I can also announce that we have a little more time uh, to uh, allow you for answering questions, uh, because the next speaker will have to turn up, uh, uh, who is uh, just about doing so. But uh, uh, so feel free to, uh, to come up with questions. Somewhat of a of a naive question, but I guess when you've got all of this optimized and working, can you use it as a diagnostic for a qubit that is, say, behaving poorly or something along those lines? Um, you could. It would be a little bit of a convoluted way to do the diagnostics. We have some very simple tests for that. Uh, for instance, you'll if you dig around in the data you see that some qubits sometimes all of a sudden go bad. And this is because there might be some fluctuator close to the qubit, which is interfering with that. And a simple way to pick that up is to look at one point on the T1 curve. If all of a sudden it drops, then you know that something went wrong. Yeah, uh, so uh, Jens, may I just hand over? Ah, wonderful talk. Thanks for this. Um, you mentioned these um, entanglement witnesses and how they are very nicely statistically um, like uh, confidently, like showing good numbers. But have you also looked at like quantitative witnesses in the sense that you get a certain value and then you relate this quantitatively to some sort of entanglement qualifier, some entanglement measure, saying that given the data that you have, you are at least so and so entangled in quantitative terms because that would surely be in your data. Yeah, that's that's a good point. We didn't look at that, but I think it would be very easy to extract from the data. It probably just relates directly to the magnitude of the witness, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we could do that. Further questions? Uh, thanks for the talk. So um, I was wondering how hard it is to create these uh, shared by pairs on two different devices. Mm -hmm. um, it's, not, it's not too difficult. It requires a uh, fairly simple circuit machinery. Let me try and bring up the uh, relevant slide again. Um, yeah, so let's just wait for it to flip through. There we go. So this here is the circuit that allows you to create these cut bell pairs, but you need to execute it multiple times with the right values for the parameters theta here. And when you do that, you kind of sum up your counts in the appropriate way, you get the same statistics as a bell pair, or in this case, two bell pairs. Okay. Right. So a lot of the co complexity of the work is in having to run these multiple circuits. And so if you could give me a tool which is producing bell pairs and I can then deterministically bring these bell pairs into my qubits, we could get rid of all of this QPD business and simply start using the teleportation circuits as shown here. Okay, thanks. Further questions? Yeah, big attack. So you said at one point that you could get rid of the quasi-probability quasi distribution. Could you say again why that was the case? Right. So if you imagine a 
quantum computing architecture, a modular architecture. Yes. Can you say that again? Okay. okay. If you if you imagine a modular quantum computing architecture where you have several yep, chips, yep. Uh, yep. the the easiest thing that you can do is what we did here, which is connect them through a That's classical cool. channel. Now, if you could have some kind of a quantum channel that allows you to distribute bell pairs between the chips, yeah, exactly. then you can get rid of the QPD. Right. Yes. But that's uh, a lot easier said than done. Further questions? By the way, what's uh, the lifetime of such a bell pair? Uh, it depends on the lifetime of the, the qubits. I would say it's directly related to the T1 and T2 times, which are on our hardware on the order of a few hundreds of microseconds. And how does it compare to uh, the switching time in the circuits? So it's mm -hmm. perfectly well within tuning, I believe. Yes, yes, definitely. So the time it takes to do this feed forward is a little bit below a microsecond, right? So maybe less than a percent of your coherence time. For error mitigation, we made this a little bit longer, but it's still well within the coherence time. So I see now we're talking about numbers. I have a follow-up question to precisely on that. I was wondering, your latency time is one microsecond. That seems pretty long. What is the, what's limiting that? Okay, what is limiting the... Um, the feed-forward time. The feed-forward, right, yeah. right. It's the fact that a lot is happening in the control electronics. When you look at the superconducting qubits, and you do these mid-circuit measurements, you send the pulse to a readout resonator. This pulse already lasts uh, a bit less than a microsecond. And then the signal travels back up to a card that needs to be digitized, classified, stored in memory. And then based on that, the controllers need to make a decision. You're saying that the pulse so that you send already is nearly a microsecond. Yeah, so add on top of that about a microsecond of delay for all of the classical stuff to, so can to you, happen. Can you improve that? Sorry? Can you, what's the outlook for improving that? Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure how much you can improve it. You can probably improve it a little bit, but in the end, it's also de dominated by the time it takes for a classical processor to so compare to numbers and the time it takes for a signal, uh, a classical signal to travel through a few wires. Okay. Uh, do you take, is this an average over all of the feed forward between the QPUs as well as inside a QPU? Um, so this number is the number, is the, the, the amount of time it takes from the end of the measurement uh, yes. to the point in time when the gate is applied. But inside one QPU? Inside one QPU, exactly. And that's, that's a good point, actually. In the first experiment with 103 qubits on one single QPU, yes. this latency was a little bit shorter. And on the two QPUs, it was a little bit longer because the time travel for the signal yes, exactly. is a little bit longer. Yeah. Yes, definitely. So this is covered in this slide here. The error mitigation or the error suppression that we did was the staggered dynamical decoupling sequences to get rid of the ZZ crosstalk in the qubits, because that is particularly detrimental when the qubits are idling. And then we did this zero noise extrapolation where we stretched the, uh, the circuit. I think what would be nice to explore in the future is to do the type of error mitigation that is done in probabilistic error cancellation or probabilistic error amplification. What you would do there is you would keep the duration of the switch constant but you would try and learn the noise that incurs and then probabilistically um, cancel that noise. So there's definitely improvements that can be done to this. Yes, we used linear here because it seemed to work well empirically. I know that there is a lot of work out there in the literature that discusses which conditions should be used for exponential or multi-exponential fits. Uh, here we empirically used linear, it seemed to work. <laughs>